So um, we're talking about the significance of Jesus Christ. Because when we understand how significant he is, we are compelled to order our life to underline it. That the word significance simply means importance. It could be some synonyms are like outstanding, notable, serious, with consequence. Jesus is extremely significant and our hearts know it a bit, our minds might think that we know it better, but significance is not really noted by our just our simple assent. There has to be something that is echoed within us that it that it reverberates. You now for instance there's there's a way that you can say something is significant or important and really you can tell a lot by even the inflection of the person. It's like you know, somebody could say, this pizza is really good. I mean, it's really, it made a significant difference. Or you could say, you know, you have a heart problem. This doctor is very important to see. Same word, important significance, but somehow its connotation, one means, one means more about life and death than the other. And we're talking about Jesus Christ. We're talking about him being significant that to our minds really could come across as an understatement because we could think he's significant, but do we really understand he's significant in the same way that the archangel Gabriel does, in the same way that Paul does, in the same way that the Father does? And we are sons of the Father, and we are to bear testimony we ourselves are to signify that Jesus is not just significant, but he is the ultimate of what is significant. For him, it's not just physical life and death, and it's that, but it is life and death, period. It is life of any consequence in a full sense or no life at all. Now, these are words, but what's important is that the Lord himself wants us to bear an image, be an evidence, and give a testimony that we do believe that he's significant much more than a great pizza might be, and much more than even a great heart surgeon might be. That there's no one that rivals his significance, his importance, and that he himself, on him, turns everything about reality and purpose and meaning, and that he himself is all the difference between knowing God truly, intimately, in such a way that we reflect him, or just knowing about him in our heads. Now this morning when I was praying, and I was you know, praying about trying to help us understand the significance, because see, our call is to have such an awareness of his significance that we really do reflect it in how we live not by just what we say. And as I was praying about this, the Lord uh, gave me a passage. I mean, it dropped into my mind. And I'm going to uh, read that and make some comments, make connections here about significance. So this is actually from Proverbs 26, 23. And in this, it says, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. So this is the father speaking to his son. And by the way, for a context, it's not like a, an eight-year-old. It's, it's someone who's just ready to emerge to be married. It's, it's an older son. And he's, this father is asking his son to listen, but to listen in a particular way. He's trying to instruct his son in this context, and in this sense, to actually know the Lord. Because the father is to teach their sons to know the Lord. And he's saying to them that, look, before I can teach you, something has to happen first. And I have to get your attention. You know, I have to make sure that you're really engaged with me right now. And the son needs to focus. Son, you need to focus right now, just not on what I'm going to teach you, 
But to focus, and this is really important, before you can do that, you have to give me your heart. Your, you, if I don't have your heart, all you're going to get is information. Your heart is going to be unaffected. You've got to give me your heart, and you've got to notice my heart. He's actually trying to communicate his heart to his son. Not simple facts. And so, in essence, he's saying to his son, I've got a heart for God. My heart is God. My life is God. My life is given over to love him. And he has wisdom for you. And he wants you to know him in the way that I know him. But before you can do this, you have to focus your heart. That is, you have to give me your core. You have to be there. You have to be engaged. You have to listen in a deep way so that your heart is able to be in sync with my heart. So that your heart and my heart are one on this. And so you receive this as a dad who loves you, and you know I love you, and I want you to experience this love, and I want you to have wisdom and know God, so give me your heart. And you can see that if you give me your heart, you'll better understand why I'm alive and why you're alive. Because if the son's heart is not in the right place, if the son does not give full attention, like this is a matter of life or death, no matter how well the father puts it and how articulate he is, that it's just going to be a waste of time. And of course we see that in real life. The father might want to be communicating to a son or daughter, or a mother might be wanting to communicate the same to one of their children. And if, if this just really isn't making sense to their life, and they're thinking it's not important, then they're not going to listen. And I believe the Lord gave me this passage because th- the reason that we don't really honor, and that's the word I'll use, honor the significance of Christ is that there's a way where we've held back some of our heart. Now I know that we have a love for God. And I know that we have a care for God. But the, what is the Lord's heart for us? The Lord's heart for us is to understand that when he gave his son, that was very, very significant to him. He could not give more than what he could give in the fullness in his relationship with his son. Now, he gives his son to us as an expression of great honor. He honors us. Because, you know, honor is, you can tell by how someone honors someone else, by the measure of the gift. And now we are actually gifted with the son of God. We are gifted with the spirit of God. We are gifted with the kingdom of God. We are gifted with the heart of God that desires us to be blessed. So God himself makes it very clear about his heart. But how many people are stunned and compelled by the love of God that so much so they want to make their life in total, a total yielded clay to his imprint so that when people would look at your life and my life, they would say, to this person, God is everything. The Lord is saying in his heart, he wants us not just to have a love for him, but that the love that he demonstrated in the bosom of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, would be that same love that would be within our own chest and breast, and that heart would be just like his. Now you might hear that and you think, oh, that's way too much. And it is way too much, but not the way you think. It's way too much good. It's way too much of a treasure it's almost, it is too much to physically contain. It's wonderful, it's beautiful, and it shows that our God has not held back. Most people, including Christians, the first thing that comes into their mind when they think of God is not, he just loves so much, we have to say, too much for me to ever comprehend. 
But you and I are meant to be this imprint and this evidence that that's the way he is. By how lavish we are in loving God. Now this isn't something we put on, it's something that's gifted to us in Christ who lives in us. That's important. It's not like we try to love him and now we can, we've achieved it. It's like we let him love us because we've given him our heart. We haven't held back. We look at the sun and we see what that looks like. See, Jesus and the Father, the Father and the Son, the Father could tell Jesus anything and Jesus would receive it to his heart. The Father would speak a word and for Jesus it was not a suggestion. It was not an idea to entertain. If the Father said it, he said, I am one with the Father, I will do it. And he does not do it out of duty. He does it out of love. And he receives the word, not out of a raw, harsh command, but out of a loving word from the Father to his Son. And the Son has the heart of the Father. His heart is open to the Father. And that one sees how much the Father loves him because he has not held back his heart. So much so that he, he would rather die for the Father than continue to live without him. So we look at Jesus and say, Jesus, the Father is significant to you. And he would say, I can do nothing apart from the Father. I only do what the Father tells me to do. I have been sent to do what the Father asks me to do. I've not come to do my own will, but to him who, have sent, who has sent me. That's the heart of the one who knows that God, the Father, is significant. And he's the only one that has seen the Father. He's the only one who really knows the Father through and through, because he, as God, has inhabited and in, was in communion and is in communion with this God who loves fantastically, just overabundantly. And brothers and sisters, that's what the Lord wants to do in your heart and in my heart. And the first thing is we must lift up our expectations, expectations up to him. What does he want? What is his expectations for us? Brothers and sisters, his expectations for us is not to perform like some kind of hamster on a wheel or a dog in a circus. And that's what some people view God as. He's going to make me do something I don't want to do. No, never. He will never do that. He will call to your heart and to the, who you really are in Christ. And he will allow you to sink your will with his will so that you can do and be what you really want to do and be, which is to be so one with him that you reflect the love of God. That's the gospel. The gospel is the love of God that compels us, is the relationship with the Father alive in us, in our hearts, the way it was alive in the Son. And if we want to know about what's on the Father's heart, it's to be just like his Son. Because you know what? We are sons. That's what we say all the time, right? We identify with the Father as sons. Well, that is great to say. Now let's explore it more deeply. What does that mean? It means that the Father has a heart. And it means we will not limit our expectations. We will receive the Father's expectations as our own, which are limitless. So what's the point of the sermon? The point of the sermon is, is that we so predispose our hearts that we are open to receive God as he is and allow him to be as significant as he truly is in our lives. That it radiates from the core of our beings. That we have found the treasure, and we treasure him who is the treasure. We give honor to whom the honor is due. And this one has honored us so much, brothers and sisters, there's no way that we could come close to honoring him the way he's honored us. But he gives us the privilege and the opportunity to honor him, and it is a gift, to honor him with our love, where we say, God, you are so great, and you are so loving, and you have not held back, and you've given me this life so that I can know you who created me. And so, God, I ask by your Holy Spirit that you allow me to receive you as you are, and that your expectations would be my expectations, 
and that I would exalt you as the one that is not just a significant part of my life, but is life itself. Because if you are just a part of my life, Father, I recognize I will not give you the glory due your name. You must be everything. And that's what our heart cries. We must honor the Lord appropriate to how he has honored us. He did not hold back his heart. He's not some cold father that's going to hide things from us. But he's a generous father who wants everything he has for his sons. So that all that he is, he wants to to have in our life. You see, Jesus is significant. Paul says that all things were made through him and for him. Whether it was what is visible or invisible, whether it's thrones or dominions, powers, that all things that are created were made through him and for him. That's a significant person, brothers and sisters. That needs to reverberate from our spirit. That comes from the throne of God, from our Father, into our hearts, those who have received the spirit of the Son. That reverberates in us, and that's the joy, and that's the power, and that's what will cut through darkness. It comes to a time when we have to understand we must be all light and there must be no darkness at all. And now you might think, well, that's a high and lofty thing. Well, look, yes, to be a son is a high and lofty thing. But it's not out of your work or my work. It comes about as we look to the Lord and he creates that in us and through us. You see, the point of the sermon is that we would lift up our eyes, that we would lift up our hearts, And that we would be able to say, I am committed to this aim. That the heart that lives in the Son, my master, my brother, the King of Kings, is going to live in me. And it will be by his doing and by his grace and not mine. All he asks is for my attention. If he has my attention, then I can live his intention. We have to just simply give him our attention. What happens, though, is on the earth, our heads are turned. You know what that means, that expression, when their head is turned? Maybe someone who's, you're talking to your, to your spouse, and then all of a sudden this, like, you know, beautiful girl walks by. You're having a good conversation, and the person turns his head away from his wife. His, he's got, his attention was diverted from something that was in a meaningful relationship to something that just attracted his eye. Or that, again, it can play with something else with with a woman as well. Somehow something else, maybe more beautiful than what she perceives herself to be, grabs her attention and she begins to think, I wish I looked like her. That's a diverted attention. The Father wants our attention on him. And he's just asking, can you allow my Holy Spirit, can you allow my Holy Spirit to do what he's supposed to do inside of you? And can you allow him to do that inner work inside of you to show you how beautiful I am? Can you call out to him and ask him to lead you? Ask him to lead you. That shows the desire of your heart. You are involved because you're asking and you mean it. But can you ask him to give you enlightenment, revelation, to see how beautiful I am so that your attention would not be diverted, your head would not be turned, but you'd be of a single eye and a single focus, and that you would say, no matter how many failings you have, that the aim of your heart, the direction of your soul, is to have a heart just like the sun. That's what this sermon's about, that we would desire that, that we'd focus that, that we position our heart to receive that, that we would know that that is more possible than you could ever think, because if God can send his own son, and if he can create matter from nothing that we know if he's risen his son he can raise us up with him that we might experience that resurrection life don't try to think i don't know how I'll ever they have that happen it's not up to you it's not in your power all he's asking is can you make it your desire can you make it the aim of your life he'll take it from there do you hear that it's not perfection it's intention it's it's affection it's attention That's what the Lord's asking of us. Now, if that happens, brothers and sisters, we're going to begin seeing and knowing things that we could ever know just with our head. In the first analogy that are used from Scripture and Proverbs, that son may have taken great notes, 
But his life itself was not noteworthy because it was just in the head. But when the son gives his heart, that means, God, you have my life. Redirect it. If there's anything that happens to be a contradiction to my resolve to have your heart in my heart, I ask Holy Spirit that you would show me that. And then I ask Holy Spirit that you would continue to give me the strength and the wisdom to surmount those seeming obstacles and let it be a display of the infinite love of God inside of me, that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. That is not I, but it's the grace of God in me. That's what the Lord wants, a people who know the grace of God, that it can do that work inside of us so then we can begin to believe and not wonder how I'm going to do it. We know how it's going to happen, and it's not going to be us. We just have to desire it, and the Lord will bring it about. That's what the Lord has for his people. That's his desire for us. And when we just simply order our desires on his desire, we will see the church glorious. We will see Jesus in our midst. It will be in our eyes. It will be in, in our intonation. And it will be compelling. This is for us, brothers and sisters, every single believer, every single person can enter into this more and more. We need to understand that this is the work of God and not the work of man. We began, it began as the work of God and it continues as the work of God. And the more and more that we can stay there, the more and more that we'll experience the joy and the power and the presence of God. That's what he wants for us because we're his sons and he cares about us. And he'll bring this about if we simply say, yes, Lord, make it happen. And I will not be satisfied with any other aim in my life but what is on your heart to be in my heart.